Thanks very much, Fabian. Thanks for everyone uh, for coming here. Thanks, Anna, for, for making this idea and uh, putting this idea in reality when I was visiting one of Forrest's meetup several months ago. Thank you, Jörg, for hosting this meetup in this really incredible place. Thanks a lot. And give me some book tips afterwards after <laughs> you've listened to that. Um, I, I read Faust 1, but not 2. I should probably <laughs> catch up there, but um, I would be interested in more interesting books after you've heard what I have to say. Um, yeah, my name is Markus Dapp. I'm a senior research assistant at the ETH um, at the Chair for Computational Social Science. That's quite a mouthful. Um, so this group tries to use computational methods, um, modeling and simulation and other data heavy things um, to explain social phenomena. My background is not directly from there. I, I studied at ETH, I did computer science and technology management and I did my PhD with political science people, so I saw different, different places. Um, and tonight I want to talk about a research project uh, which we call Finance 4. <coughs> and well, um, it's blockchain based, you have heard this already, but there's I think much more to it than the technology. Not much to say about this picture. Um, you just have to open any of your preferred news outlets to see one of these or similar ones or related to these. We have a set of growing global challenges um, that seemingly out of nowhere, all of a sudden, all of them at the same time arise. And of course, it's not the case that um, we behaved badly last year, now all these problems are here, but they accumulated over time. And this exactly is one of the reasons we think these problems occur, because humans are just not very good in long time spans. What we do today and the effects it has decades in the future, we, we, most of us are not even thinking about it. We only started. The word sustainability is only a few uh, um, decades old, although the concept is much older, um, but we are just not good in this. Now, could we compress time? It would be useful if, if we would see earlier these effects or get, get at least get a signal. Something that tells us, well, you do this today, nothing bad has happened yet, but there may be happening something in the future. And we would need a strong signal. And one of the strongest signals societies have to show things is money, right? It, it, it signals what we value and it signals also what we do or what we aspire. So time is money. And I want to think quite differently about money tonight. And I invite you to, to join me on, on, on that journey and to, to go probably one, one step back and, and look at it not as the thing we need every day, we go to work to get this money to be able to spend it in the shops in the, in, in the evenings and it repeats every day except Sunday. Um, but money can be a signal of what we value, of what is valuable to us. But money is also future potential, it's like stored energy. People with a lot of this money resources can move many more things than people who, who have not. That's just how it works without today's concept of money. That's how it works, right? And this money is also directed energy. And sadly enough, today, it has only this one direction. It maximizes profit and it ignores all other things. It's called externalities. It's considered, in theory and in practice, to be external effects to the actual thing. And therefore, it's, we're basically blind. And, um, and there's the reason why we have the pictures we have from the first slide, right? Because it's continuously ignored on a daily basis by the majority of the people in, on the planet because we have this system that we have. And the last point, money creation is the privilege of banks, at least today, in, in today's um, um, world, with, with today's monetary systems. Um, that is the case, and the question is why? Um, that may be one reason that they who 
control the credit of a nation, direct the policy of governments, and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. At the same time, this very country is proud <laughs> to be a direct democracy. <coughs> um, and given this, and the previous slide, the coming slide with only three ideas may sound to you as very simple ideas or quite revolutionary. It depends on, on how you look at them. The first idea is let's extend this concept of money as an information signal and use it for, and use it actually as an information signal for much more than what we use it today for. Explore new monies, new concepts, new ideas for money um, that represent different incentives, not just this only one maximized profit. Because we are not work, I mean, humans do not function that way. We have so many motivations why we do things and why we don't do other things. And money is capturing this thin, thin line in this whole spectrum of, of motivations. Why not experiment with, with the technology we have at our hands now by actually letting everyone create basically their own monies? And with their own monies, I don't mean your personal money, but money that could theoretically be used by anyone. Isn't it risky to experiment with the monetary system? Yeah, but tell that to the banks. They actually do it on a large scale, continuously, already for quite some time. And we are not sure about, uh, we are not sure about what, what will come out of these experiments. So a few design principles before I get into how the system works. One is we want to create a multidimensional incentive system. Because as I said, today's system is unidirectional. It always drags you in the profit-maximizing direction. No matter what your motivations are, no matter what you do on a daily basis, at the end of the day, you're always drawn in that direction. And if you try to resist, you feel the resistance. Because the system does not reward it, right? And it, it would be much better, and this, this picture should... should symbolically show this, if you would be dragged in different directions that, that give counterweights to, 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 well, in all directions, to, to reflect better what we as, as humans value and the diversity of things we value. The second aspect is we want to have these new experiments be bottom-up. Anyone should be able to make a proposal for one of these directions. And if it's picked up by a larger group of people and it's successful, then it's there. And if it's not, it's not. It doesn't matter. But it's a very different way of looking at the, at the, at the financial system compared to what, what the monoculture we have today. And of course, um, <clears throat> because we have this technology that has already been mentioned, um, we want to have this in a, in a network of peers, of equals. That means nobody who's participating in this financial network has more rights than anyone else in the network. That's very different to today. And the question is, of course, immediately, but how do you do this? Uh, banks have a role in, 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 in how we set up the system today. Um, and you cannot just ignore them. Central banks have a role. Governments have a role in, in, in monetary um, um, frameworks, let's say, and environments. And also, if you, if you say this, you basically automatically come to the question, uh, to, to, to the point that the governance of such a network must be democratic. How, how else should it, should it work? Now with that, the question is, what would you do if you could create money? with a purpose that is different to maximizing profit. What would you do? This is just one way, uh, sorry, this one. with um, one example with, with a structure of in which directions you could think. Which problems in your life or in your friends or family's life are problems you would like to address? Stuff people do today, but they don't do it at scale. 
because it's not worth it. It's a good deed and you get a thank you if you're lucky, but that's about it. What, what, what would you like to see more in the world happening systematically because people have an incentive to do it? And all of us in this room will, have, will come up with different ideas. Maybe you will have similar ideas and you would implement it differently and then the solutions would compete as well. We would have a system that, that allows for monies to compete, not only people in, 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 in certain, like, in, 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 like we have it today, that, that companies compete on, on certain markets, but the money systems themselves or the, the, the different tokens would compete as well. And the result would be potentially large array of very different coins slash tokens. So in this whole distributed ledger and blockchain world, we are doing much more than just programming a piece of software. In the Web 1.0 and the Web 2.0, the software that was written just did something, right? In the beginning, it was only on my computer. With the internet, it was on different computers, and so we could communicate and exchange information and, and files and so on. Um, and yeah, your software worked or it didn't work, right? You, maybe it had bugs or not, but that's about it, what the software uh, could do. In our case, with this new technology, we can build software that also has basically no bugs, but still it wouldn't work because we're trying to enable economies. And that's a much more complex undertaking. And you cannot plan it. It's, it's an illusion to think, let's create a few tokens and people will pick them up and then something nice will happen in the future. We simply don't know yet. We are dealing with, with uh, complex systems. And as you can see there, there's a, a lot of things to, to think about. So that really looks, looks complicated and, and difficult to do. But you can also look at it in a very simple, down-to-earth way. You plant a tree and you prove it to the system that you planted the tree and the system rewards you with a tree token. One example. <laughs> and of course, there are many more actions. You recycle your stuff. You help someone in need, be it an elderly, a sick person, a child, it doesn't matter. You clean the ocean. You can act in positive way, in, in a, a, a thousand positive ways, which are not rewarded today. And on the other side, the system would offer those people different tokens for recycling, for taking care, for cleaning stuff up, for any positive action. And therefore, at the moment, we call them positive action tokens. To dive a bit into the system, you are, oh, sorry, it doesn't work with, with such monitors. You are here, users. Users would look into the system and see, oh, all these tokens are basically available. <coughs> and what do I have to do to get one of them? In the case of the tree token, you would need to prove to the system that you actually planted a tree. How would you do this proving? Well. You could use your, your camera on the mobile phone and take a picture of yourself and the tree that you planted. Maybe you need two pictures, one before the planting and one after the planting. There is a lot of room for, for um, cheating, which is a fundamental problem of all blockchain projects or systems because yeah, if, if the wrong information gets in, it stays there and you cannot change it and it has all the good properties of that technical solution, but it's still the wrong data. But anyway, um, so you can use technology. Your mobile phone, which has a, already a lot of sensors, you can actually use sensors from the Internet of, of Things. And in cases where technology doesn't cut it because there's no sensor measuring this, we think about so-called social proofs. Other users would approve your action. And you can think about what's their incentive to do that and how could we incentivize them to prove other people's actions and how can we also um, avoid that they cheat. Let's assume no cheating happens. Um, you make a claim to, to any of these tokens, you prove them and you obtain the respective token. And the actions can be basically anything. 
Now that system is open and available to everyone. That means we will sooner or later have a long list of tokens, just because everyone can suggest something. So how do you, how do you separate the good ones from the not so good ones or the even malicious ones? In other words, how do we recreate some democratic elements into the governance of such a system? This layer is the layer I just showed you. Positive action tokens, everyone can create. And actually, you can do this anonymous. It's anonymous in the sense that you have a, a so-called public address, so it's similar to Bitcoin. Um, but it says nowhere that, that Ben or Marcus or Jörg created this token. And it doesn't have to. The token design has to speak for itself. But on a, on a second layer, <clears throat> we need to think about how to, how to govern such a system. And one, one of the key problems is a lot of different tokens, and some are good and some are not so good. You could say, yeah, over time people will figure out, but probably we can be faster. The bourse, the stock exchanges today have different segments, right? You have premium segments, you have some maybe something in the middle, and you have stuff that's really risky and, and not so much so strongly regulated and handled with care, and if you know what you're doing, go there, but you don't have to. And the higher up you go in the segments, the more regulated and the, the, the more safe it is for people who haven't invested a lot of time to think all through the risks or all, all the difficulties to actually still be able to invest. And we have a similar idea for these tokens. Um, so we would introduce a few governance tokens, or tokens helping us to, to run the system, and one of them would be a governance token. And I cannot go into the technical details at the moment, but there are methods in this new world that allows us as a group to agree on a list of good tokens without talking to each other, without knowing each other, with, by being in separate rooms. I cannot, actually, I cannot explain this in two minutes, but I'm happy to talk about it in, in, later on. Um, for those who want to look it up in the internet, it's called Token Curated Registry. The registry is this list of things. In our case, it's, uh, it's these tokens. And it works like it, it's a mixture between poker and voting. So somebody would propose and put money on the table, namely these governance tokens, and somebody who wants to challenge would put the similar amount, as the same amount on, on the table, and then there would be a voting. And one side wins and one side loses, and the losing side would lose their tokens, which would be distributed among the winners. So that's the very, very simplified version of this. Um, because that introduces also different things. I mean, if you start, you don't have any governance tokens. How do you get these governance tokens? Well. There's where reputation comes in, because governance tokens are related not to individuals, but related, are related to these tokens. You can gain reputation through using the system, through contributing to the stability of the system. If you prove actions of other people, you normally don't get any of their, these tokens, but you gain reputation. And that closes some of the circles in the system that, that allows it to... to to self-organize and actually emerge and, and develop over time. Um, I'm not talking much about this because we are at the very beginning in the conceptualization of this, but it's linked to the question, why should any community join this place, this Finance 4 platform, if they also could do the same just on their own, right? You, all this blockchain software, um, most of the blockchain software is open source, so people can use it and create their own blockchains and they can just think about tokens and do it. And, and we want to give them an offer and, and, and make, make an offering that is attractive, that uses network effects in the whole thing. And so uh, something like a, a liquidity reserve um, for each token that is accepted as a, as a good token it is an idea. So I'm, I'm happy to hear ideas um, if, if you have some. And on the other end of the spectrum, not related to monetary things at all is identity. Um, you may be surprised why I'm talking about identity in, in this context now, um, but it's a huge topic within the DLT blockchain research and also practitioner space that um, 
Today, like money, or similar or analog to money, identity is given by states. And if the states work, you have a passport and it's all good. But not in all states it's working like this. And then you can get um, identities or passports which you shouldn't get, and etc. etc. So the idea, a, a new concept here is, um, what about self-sovereign identity? That you create a, rep, uh, um, a proof of your identity based on your past, and it belongs to you. It's not given to you in form of a passport by the state, but you create it. Because after all, it's your past actions that define who you are today. And also you have different social networks you are, I'm not talking about Facebook, you are in different social networks and in different networks you, you, you assume different identities, which are not reflected in one piece of paper with a number. So you, you can imagine, uh, you raise one question, you create 10 new ones in this space currently, and it's actually a new emerging discipline in research. Not even the name is clear yet. Um, some people talk about crypto economics or crypto economic design. Some others talk about token engineering. And I just listed just for you um, um, a, a few definitions of, of some of the players in the field. I like this one because it's, it's quite short and, and, and quite understandable. Um, create interconnected communities of autonomous actors within which efficient value exchange is enabled by technology. And the interesting thing is, autonomous actors are not only humans, uh, autonomous actors. In this new space, you can have so-called smart contracts that, yes, have been programmed in the beginning, in the first place, but once unleashed uh, to the world, they, they act on their own. They, they act based on the rules set they have been given. Um, so, so this technology and, and, and this thinking, this bringing together of cryptography and economics um, allows for a heap of stuff we couldn't do until now. We can create new socio-economic models that, that simply don't exist because these tokens I was showing to you on the previous slide um, all have some, most of them, at least the lower ones, you would say, yeah, it's a bit like money, I can collect them and then I have more and I can maybe pay with the tree coin and then we have to figure out, is a tree coin more or less than a kilogram of plastic recycling? Okay, there could be a market, I kind of understand. But you can create tokens that have nothing to do with today's money. As, um, let's say we create a token that cannot be transferred. You can create it, you do stuff, and you have it, and you can collect more of it, but you cannot transfer it. That could be reputation. That could be the basis of identity. If you have several of them, I do more of this, I'm, I'm more of this kind of person, I do more of this. Maybe I teach or I, I repair or I do woodwork or I, whatever it is. Um, you can do in vitro experiments, which we also have a hard time to do. Usually you have lab experiments where you give people the choice, do you want to have 10 today or 100 in 10 months? And people think, yes, no, maybe not. Here you can do completely new things. You, we could organize ourselves as a prediction market um, and we could say uh, will the current president be the next president in the United States, yes or no? And it's not just do you think yes or no, but you put money on the table and based on that we calculate or we, we bring together the collective wisdom of this group and then you may say with 0.38% um, 0.38 of, of, of one, uh, we think it won't, or maybe it will. But we can do things we, we simply couldn't do so far. Then you have probably heard about decentralized autonomous organizations. I'm, I'm not going into that. We can talk about it later. And, and artificial life forms, because there are people that say, well, if I have a piece of software that runs on an immutable ledger on its own, on, based on smart contracts and it can pay me to do services to it like give electricity or move it from this place to another place some people argue it's not so it fits certain definitions of life and there this project is a basically it's an artwork it's a plant it's called a plant to eat 
It has a Bitcoin wallet, and if you do good to the plant, you get rewarded in Bitcoin. And no humans involved, except you who do the good service. All this raises huge questions about power distribution. Because we do not want that those who create these tokens are the ones who control them, who, who decide about how your wallet looks half a year from now. We don't want that. But the crypto economic design of a system decides over people's behavior because we want, to, I mean, that's the starting point. We want to create an incentive system. And so we have to think really hard about potential uh, areas of misuse. So who decides about the rules and who decides who can decide about these rules? Is participation voluntary or is it mandatory? Usually I get the question after a presentation like this, I get the question, how is that different to China's citizen score? This is exactly the difference. In China's citizen score, it's a very small group deciding on the rules and the metrics. And they, because of the power structures that, that exist there, they can define the rules. In our system, nobody defines the rules on their own. No single unit has more power than another single unit. We can all make proposals for tokens, and if you propose stupid tokens, people will just not use them because, yeah. And if you produce, if if you create a token that is kind of useful but it's badly designed, people will come up with a better design, and you you're still gone. We have competition in a way we we don't have at all today. Yeah, and then if you try to combine. Uh, the, so the last line is a buzzword line. If you combine distributed ledger technology and the Internet of Things and AI, which of course is possible and, and, and sometimes also needed, ethical design questions come. I'm not sure if I should talk a lot about this slide because it's, it's really complicated. Um, let's focus on the right side. Um, because it's, it's this essence of, of why um, DLT and blockchain systems are different to normal quote-unquote software. Because we try to create a certain behavior. So in our case, the Fin4 system wants to have communities that create accounting, trading, new multidimensional notions of social ecological value. And how do we get there? Well, this requires different roles. Obtainers are the ones who try to get these positive action tokens. You just go there and, and see what actions can be done and what suits you, and then you do it and you collect these tokens. And then there are creators, those who take pride in creating great tokens. Um, and then there are provers or reviewers who want to, to gain influence, like, like politicians today who want to gain influence. And what does that require? Well, on the next lower level, it requires tokens that actually are fungible and, and, and represent positive actions. We need logic to, to represent these proving of, of actions. The registry of good like official tokens and, and non-official tokens I, I already mentioned, reputation, etc. And that's the enabled economy. This is what we want to enable. And we are building on an already existing economy, which is the enabling economy. In our case, it's the Ethereum um, platform, which is the second largest public blockchain, and it differs in, uh, to, to Bitcoin in, um, um, significantly in the way because it offers smart contract functionality, and, and Bitcoin, as, as we know, um, doesn't. But if you have questions with that, I'm happy to talk about it. So we need to do more than just develop software to come up with good solutions. One of the things is simulations. If you're interested in that question, Annabelle, who is just taking nice pictures, um, is, is helping us in, in, in that space. Um, so you, you make assumptions about who joins the system. Are they good people? Are they malicious people? How do they behave? And based on that, you can simulate certain actions and see whether the system deviates in the wrong direction or, or sort of breaks um, or not. <clears throat> And of course, another step is doing real life experiments. IRL means in real life. Um, so we have um, a cooperation with KISS. KISS is a time banking scheme in Zug and, and different other cities in Switzerland. 
at WWF, you, I'm sure you know, we, we have two project slash pilot ideas, concepts with them. One is um, to try to avoid poaching, um, Wilderei, in, in the Carpathians. And the other one is um, measuring CO2 capture capacity of trees um, in a way that doesn't need a whole cascade of the gold standards of the world to come up with, a, with an estimate and, and, and a reliable measure or metric. And with Climate Kick we have a few other projects, I can talk about this later. If you want to know more, there are two publications. Um, one is a paper with, where we just um, uploaded the version 2 of it, because that one was already a bit old. Um, I didn't put the link. I give you the link afterwards. It, it's on, uh, yeah, I, I give it afterwards. And the other one is a book chapter I wrote, um, yeah, of a book called Business Transformation to Blockchain. Um, 